So um, please join me in welcoming Dr. Kumar today. He is fresh back from his sabbatical, so <laughs> we're very glad that you came back so you could talk to us. Thank you. Thank you, Fiona. And um, it's a real, real honor to be uh, selected as an entrepreneurial fellow. Um, so um, I think uh, when I was on sabbatical, somebody, somebody uh, at C4C decided on this title. <laughs> so so uh, it's given me a, um, a fair amount of, uh, forced me to think a fair amount about how to generate a talk, which is not a technical talk, because that's what I uh, do in my dreams, is give a technical talk and there's no problem. So I've been thinking a lot about what would be appropriate um, uh, to, to say today. So <coughs> uh, disrupting the single-use uh, disposable cup market. So as you, as you can sort of gather from this title that, that um, a company is targeting this uh, specific market, which is, uh, uh, which is disposable cups, you know, uh, coffee cups. Uh, to begin with. So I'd like to, I think I, I have enough cups here. So I'd like to give, I'd like you all to take a cup and this is what we're talking about, okay? Um, so this cup, um, this cup is being purchased by a number of airlines. This cup has been optimized for in-line, in-flight in coffee service. And uh, right now, Alaska United and Virgin America. So you, you probably find one of these three uh, company logos on, on this cup. And there are other airlines also uh, that are in the queue. They are in the queue because we don't have the capacity right now to serve them all. <coughs> so um, very simply, so this is what we're talking about. Our, uh, uh, the, the value that in, in this product comes from the fact that we are using, we are converting used water bottles to something useful. Okay, there's a huge supply there's a very large number of water, water bottles consumed in the United States, uh, and a good, good portion of them are being recycled, and so this is a, a raw material source. And uh, if you look at the plant, the input to the plant is basically, you know, uh, the polymer coming from the bottles and carbon dioxide. Those are the two inputs, and the output is the coffee cup and other food service items and other products that are waiting in the wings. But today we'll talk about the cup. And, um, and the first customer uh, for this coffee cup uh, was Alaska Airlines. So uh, the company focused on this particular, the airline industry for a number of reasons to launch its first product. You know, we have a captive audience uh, on the flight. Uh, they really get to experience the cup uh, over a period of time, so we can get uh, good feedback. And, and um, we have the opportunity to actually collect these cups. So these cups themselves are recyclable because they're made from a recyclable plastic called the PET. So we want to collect them back and develop the infrastructure slowly for capturing them back in the wider market. Microgreen, very briefly, uh, <coughs> was started by uh, two of my students in 2002. Uh, it is located in uh, Arlington. They have so far, so far uh, raised uh, $52 million in investor funding in various uh, steps, various cycles, and currently employs 150 plus people. Now, <coughs> The question is, what makes Microgreen viable? So the Microgreen is a viable company today 
uh, for having proven these two hypotheses, the value hypothesis and the growth hypothesis, okay? Namely that the company uh, products uh, bring value, so they have proven that and they can grow both in sales uh, as well as in capacity and they have proven that and I'll tell you a little bit more about this. Now, what does it mean to say that you have an idea or a technology or a product that will disrupt the market or that will upset the market? This, this is the language of the business world, okay? So, if you have something that works better than the current thing that is being used, right? Or in case of cups, in case of cups, uh, the paper cup is the, has by far the largest market share. It's a paper cup and it has a, um, a, a plastic or a polymer film line, lining inside to make it impervious, okay? So, if you have a product that works better than the current one on the market, that's not enough. Nobody's going to switch based on that, okay? So there's no disruption. Um, <coughs> so today, for a product to really disrupt the market, it has to, it has to bring, uh, it has to have impact on what, what the business people call triple bottom line. I mean, it has to hit the bottom line of the company in at least three ways, okay? What are these three ways? The product has to have, uh, of course, it has to have the economic impact. That's a given. It has to bring more, more, I mean, it, it has to give same performance at a lower cost uh, for it to be considered. But it has to have an environmental impact and also a social impact because companies are looking for these other things uh, in, their, in their product line. So for, for a technology to, to be disruptive, it has to um, have all these impacts. And at the same time, it has to perform better than the current product that is on the market. So that's what it means to disrupt or to have a disruptive product. And um, microgreens uh, technology uh, was um, uh, recognized for, for having all these attributes by, uh, by DuPont Company, uh, and they gave it an award, a packaging award in 2012. Now, what, what, is, what is the value hypothesis? How does microgreen bring, bring value? So right now, we can find that there are three separate patents that have been granted for, for these things in the current cups. So the sleeve can be composted, there's a pattern for that. Um, the cup, which has this plastic liner, goes to the landfill. Um, and then the lid, uh, here it shows a black lid, but if you go to Starbucks, you see a white lid. The lid is made of polystyrene, and that has a recyclable symbol that's stamped on it, so that can be recycled. Now, um, the microgreen proposition is to, uh, to have only one stream that is needed to recycle uh, and not different streams. So you can, at the end of using the cup, you can just put it in the recycling bin. Um, <coughs> I mean, this, this uh, slide has uh, maybe too much information, but here's a summary of, um, of why there is, why this cup is a disruptive uh, technology. So uh, it has improved functional performance. So for example, um, I, will, I will show you it, its structure is a microcellular structure, which is our technology that we developed uh, at the university. So that, so the, the, the wall of the cup has uh, millions of tiny bubbles in it, okay? And that's what gives it both a reduced density, so you save on material, and it also gives it insulation, so you don't need that um, cardboard sleeve on your cup. Okay, <coughs> so improved, improved um, 
uh, functional performance. Finally, it has a superior printability. You notice that the cups you have uh, have a uh, the printing is is high quality. Okay, so even though we have a foam, it's a foam cup essentially. It has bubbles inside it, but its surface has a solid skin on it, on which you can do high quality printing. Uh, so that's 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 a value that you know our competitors uh, simply do not have. Uh, we can compete on cost because of the low material usage. You know, this cup is uh, about half, you know, half to one third the density of solid PET. So we can provide a functionality with reduced material usage, and that's where the cost savings come from. Um, then there are other, other benefits like better stacking efficiency. This, this um, uh, may not strike as important, but by the time you stack them and you put them on a truck, that efficiency matters. Okay. <coughs> um, environmental performance, uh, you know, um, so we look at source reduction. You, we save 35 to 50 percent uh, uh, material. Uh, it, they contain at least 50 percent uh, PCR is post consumer recycled content. Um, and the cup itself can be recycled after use. But the cup actually, uh, I, I, I can't guide myself to throw it away. You know? So at, at home, I just put it back in the dishwasher, this coffee cup here, and it comes out fine. Or even just wash it with soap and water like other, uh, other cups or plates. And you can use it again and again. <coughs> Okay. Um, the growth hypothesis. So, the, so the growth has been proven both in in um, in sales. What we are seeing here um, uh, is the number of cups uh, number of cups sold. So this year we expect to sell 150 million cups. By the end of 2014. Our capacity to produce the cups will go from half a million cups a day to two million cups a day. So we, in 2015, uh, we expect to sell 600 million cups. And this is not a hypothetical number. I mean, this, this, is, all, um, this is all based on current orders from the, from the airlines. So, so the company has now proven that um, it, can, it can grow both in, in numbers as well as has the ability to um, to add manufacturing lines. Now, um, I got a um, you know email from Fiona. You know, I was wondering what is this talk about, and she said, "Well, just reflect on your total commercialization experience, and uh, let's see what you know maybe." share the do's and don'ts or what worked well for you and so on. So uh, the next, uh, this is sort of the outline now for the uh, rest of my presentation. Uh, <coughs> so I would like to start, give you a little bit uh, of a feel for what is the technology that we are talking about. And then um, what are some of the factors uh, that have led to successful commercialization. And then some, some things that uh, have not worked well uh, towards commercialization. So um, the microcellular technology, or the idea to put tiny bubbles uh, in plastic, was uh, invented at MIT in early 1980s. And it was in response to this kind of a vision. You know, for, for packaging products, uh, can you save on materials? You know, the companies were like Kraft and Kodak. Uh, that brought the question uh, to MIT. And th so a process was developed uh, in, which, uh, in which tiny bubbles could be introduced and the density could be reduced. And we have worked on this technology s since I joined uh, this university because it has just had such a huge potential. So um, here is the basic, basic process, it is a batch process that was developed uh, at MIT. And in this process, 
uh, this uh, this yellow um, uh, piece here is a plastic specimen. You put it in a pressure vessel, and you subject it to a high pressure gas. Uh, the gas diffuses in, you know, one molecule at a time, and after some time, um, the, the the specimens become saturated with whatever the equilibrium saturation is for for that gas in that that polymer. So this is the, the, the stage one, and this is the time consuming stage, because this is a slow process. <coughs> uh, so for example, if I have one millimeter thick uh, polycarbonate sheet, uh, and I put it at let's say 5 MPa, uh, carbon dioxide, you know, it will take uh, 50 hours for it to saturate with gas. Then once it has gas in it, we take it out. And when we take it out, you know the gas, this is at atmospheric conditions now, room temperature. The gas immediately begins to lose uh, or come out of the specimen. And that's, that's just something that um, uh, happens naturally because there is excess gas here and that needs to come out. However, it comes out only slowly. Uh, just like it went in slowly. But when we heat the specimen to close to its glass transition, that's where we see a large number of bubbles that nucleate. Okay? So that's where we get the microcellular form. It's the foam structure in, in PET, and if we use recycled PET, uh, the process works uh, very well. So the, this basic process is very, very tolerant. So we are we, so I think I didn't say that in, uh, in my slides of what led to successful commercialization, but, but um, uh, this process happens to be very tolerant of uh, variations in your, your incoming material, um, et, et cetera. Uh, uh, it doesn't seem to um, affect you know, the, the gross bubble nucleation. So it works quite well on recycled PET. And then, <coughs> the question was, so um, we, we had a bunch of several companies working with us and the question was, okay, you can do that in a pressure vessel and you can make specimens and you know, we can make tensile specimens or impact specimens and get properties. So what? How do I realize this dream of you know, reducing the material used in, uh, in products like cups, plates, or, or packaging, right? So that question was still not answered all the way from 1980 until 1995 when in our lab we had a breakthrough uh, on how, how could, could you scale this up. So this is, this is um, so the question was if I have a roll of film, can I make a roll of microcellular film? Right? It's a simple question. So if I, put, if I take a roll which is, let's say, um, about eight inches in diameter, you know, very uh, small roll, about that big, and a certain width, I put it in a pressure vessel. It turns out, it turns out that for the gas to diffuse through this, this thickness, a four inch or 10 centimeter thickness, it will take about 15 years. So the batch process that we have is not going to work for any kind of a scale up, right? So the question is, how do you get the gas in into a roll? And the breakthrough idea is very, very simple. So one day, <coughs> one day we took a paper towel from the restroom and we re-rolled the polymer film with the paper towel uh, interleaved like this. Okay, so now there is a layer of paper towel with every layer of polymer film. And what the paper towel does is acts as a gas channeling means. So now when I, when I now put this, this roll with the paper towel in my, uh, in my pressure vessel, the gas is able to reach every layer at the same time. And now it doesn't matter how big this roll is. You can saturate it in the same time that you need to saturate 
like one single thickness of the film. So this is, this led to the, the enabling technology. This was the, this, this represents the core technology on which microgreen is based. Now they work with rolls that, that weigh like 800 pounds, they're, they're year, year big in diameter. Uh, and and everything is automated, and the, the the process works just fine. So this is a schematic of of how do you convert uh, a roll of polymer film uh, into a into a roll of foamed polymer sheet. Um, so now you can imagine, add, and this has been uh, scaled up. So I'm going to just. Um, so there's no, there's no sound uh, in this video, but um, you can see uh, this is the paper towel that we used in a three inch wide um, uh, polymer film. And we saturated with gas. And now this is simply uh, hot water at about 92 degrees centigrade. And the film is just passing through. And you can see, um, you can see the, the bubbles nucleate in, in just about this 12 inch length. Uh, or about five seconds, the, the bubbles nucleate, and then this roll is passed through this uh, cold water in this bucket here. And uh, this is a um, Italian student who made good use of the <laughs> pasta machine, okay, to demonstrate a continuous process. Um, so it is, you know, we, I say we are lucky, lucky in the sense that this process is so simple, right? All we did is uh, we, we took the film from a manufacturer. We put CO2 in it, and then we passed it through hot water. I mean, what can be simpler than that? Here you see a roll of unexpanded solid PET. It is 20 thousandths thick, and the roll is 20 inches wide by 600 lineal feet long, weighing about 100 pounds. As a preparation step, a porous interleaf material is wound into the solid polymer roll to provide a pathway for CO2 gas during the saturation step. Expanding solid state polymers is a two-step process. First, the polymer is loaded into a pressure vessel. Next, the polymer is saturated with food grade carbon dioxide in the pressure vessel for an amount of time appropriate to the application and then removed from the vessel. The carbon dioxide is now trapped between the polymer molecules and still under pressure. The interleaved and saturated roll is mounted on an unwind stand from which the polymer will be fed through a heated air flotation oven. The saturated roll is connected to a leader and the flotation oven closes. The saturated polymer is fed through the flotation oven while the interleaf material is recovered for reuse. Note that the interleaf material is white while the saturated polymer is still clear. The oven heats the polymer up to the point where it becomes plastic. And the carbon dioxide forms billions of tiny bubbles within the thickness of the polymer and a solid integral skin on the surface. As the polymer comes out of the flotation oven, it is now opaque and white because light is reflected by the bubbles in the microcellular structure. It has decreased in density while expanding about 150% in width, 150% in length, and doubling in thickness. The expanded roll will be trimmed and rewound in preparation for converting. It might now be used on a thermoforming production line, sheeted for printing and convolute forming into a cup, or perhaps an overwrap. The newly expanded PET is now twice as thick, having expanded from 20 thousandths to 40 thousandths thick. The roll width increased from 20 inches to 30 inches wide, the roll length increased from 600 lineal feet to 900 lineal feet. The roll still weighs about 100 pounds, but the volume has expanded about five times. In other words, the density is about 20% relative to the original solid material. Okay, so you saw that uh, microcellular roll looks white it turns white without adding any pigment uh, because of the small bubbles, you know, diffracting the light. So that's a that's sort of a bonus to to get you know bright white color uh, without 
without having to uh, pay for it. Uh, yeah? Why is the outside surface smooth and not rough, like all the bubbles leaving it in uh, a rough surface? OK. Um, so what happens is, um, you know, I showed you in the batch process that once I take the specimen out, uh, the gas begins to leave the surface. So when the gas leaves the surface layer, uh, it is depleted of CO2. And therefore, bubbles do not nucleate in the surface layer. So that gives me a surface skin which has no bubbles, and I can print on it. Automatic. Yeah, it's automatic. It's, so we got a, we got a <laughs> lovely property, and really just by waiting a couple of minutes. So, um, so in, in making the cup, so going so we know how to make the, the, the sheet, but the students actually came up with the idea uh, of this application, the cup application. Um, and and uh, the, the enabling technology there was to take the sheet that is coming from this manufacturing process and then form it using a mold right in line in line with this forming process, OK? So what is the benefit doing it in line? Because at that time, there's a large amount of CO2 still in the polymer sheet or the microcellular sheet. And the presence of the CO2 plasticizes the sheet, makes it more deformable, OK? So you are able to get the deep draw needed for a coffee cup, OK, without, without the cup developing a crack. So this was uh, important technology uh, that now completes the manufacturing operation for a cup. Um, subsequent to that, we had a, a series of uh, uh, projects that were funded by the Washington Technology Center. And that funding was necessary to bring this idea from a lab to something that we can go to investors with. This was the very first level proof of concept, okay? Where, where uh, we made these cups uh, in a lab, lab scale thermoformer. Um, and then this is the, this is the kind of the, the secret part of the recipe, which is, which is a, a very controlled, a gradient microstructure that is in the bubble wall that gives us you know, the stiffness, the, the feeling, the insulation uh, in this particular application. So, so that is, um, I hope that gives you a, some sense of the technology that we're talking about. So I'd like to now go back to, uh, to some thoughts on, on what worked. So the first thing I would like to say is that right from the beginning, I had an inclination and a motivation to transfer technology to industry. Because I happened to participate in a lab at MIT, which was doing that. And I, I saw the excitement of working on something that, that um, is relevant you know, for a company. So when I came here, I, I uh, uh, worked hard in my early years, you know, against the advice of my, my senior uh, colleagues who said you should be working for the tenure. Uh, this is wasted effort. But, um, but I really wanted to, to duplicate here the, the model that I was familiar with at MIT. And I was luckily, uh, with uh, some help, I was able to do it. So I, I started working with our um, university tech transfer office right from the beginning. And um, we started um, a consortium. We called it the Cellular Composites Consortium. And uh, the consortium is a wonderful, wonderful structure to do some, to, 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 to work on a platform technology, which could have applications for many companies. So, all the, so the companies that were working with us, they all had their own applications in mind. But they all were happy to, to pool the resources for fundamental developments. Um, the other thing that happens in the consortium 
and I saw this at MIT and, and was really motivated, that motivated me, was the fact that in the consortium, the companies are paying a membership fee, okay? So they pay an annual fee. We don't enter into a contract with the company that we'll do this, this, and this, you know, in 12 months. So that we had, so we have some money. It's a small, it's a smaller amount of money, but the money has no strings. And this leads to more innovation, because we are we are free to we are free to try things. So this really leads to, and in fact, this enabling technology to to make uh, Microsoft a role, it was born in the consortium. You know, um, in fact, the the one of the consortium member was is a co-inventor on this technology. So. Um, the other, uh, another factor is we have been able to create a very innovative environment in my lab. And um, over the years, we have over 75 disclosures to the, to the university, and um, we have a bunch of patents, and many, many more are pending patents. And uh, many of these are um, co-owned now with Microgreen, because Microgreen is continuing to sponsor research in my lab. So, so um, I have um, 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 sort of completed the circle in, in that we developed a technology, it, it went out, and then it, it has developed, or it has given us resources back for research in the lab. Um, another uh, thing that has helped, I think, the, con the commercialization effort is that we are always in the back of our minds, always thinking about how is something going to be made. It's not just enough to come up with a cool device or, or come up with a cool new material with some great properties. You have to be always thinking about, okay, how are you going to get it out? How will you make it in larger quantities? So I think that certainly has paid off uh, for us. Um, nothing could have happened without the financial support, and I have to say, uh, we uh, have been fortunate um, to get uh, many projects from NSF um, that helped us understand, you know, some of the science of what is going on. Um, and then in the consortium, we we had pooled resources from the companies, you know, to develop the technology platform. Uh, and finally, uh, we. WTC funded us uh, several times to develop very specific product ideas uh, with Washington companies and particularly uh, with Microgreen. C4C has been instrumental in this whole process. I mean, obviously, uh, none, none of it could have been achieved uh, without, without uh, very considerable uh, encouragement and support uh, from C4C and formerly the Office of Technology Transfer. Um, that uh, helped us um, set up the consortium. You know, the consortium agreement took us like 18 months to forge out with like 15 iterations between, between me and Greg Houts, who was the, the, our OTT rep at that time, because we wanted to get the language right for companies to come together and not fight, right? So the IP language had to be all straightened out and the processes had to be all very clear and uh, I, you know, that, um, that, that was a great accomplishment. Unfortunately, it, you know, it, it got zero credit in the tenure process, but, but that document is, uh, is very valuable. It passed all the legal tests of major corporations uh, for them to come together. So, um, um, the, the, the Trek transfer office uh, made investment in getting some of the early patents in the early 90s, uh, and they did that, um, you know, without having a licensee begging to license that technology at that time. So having those, some of those early ideas patented um, helped, helped to, to uh, launch this company, or license, license it and provide a foundation. Um, the, the C4C, um, of course, you know, developed uh, the, the 
very detailed uh, license agreement with microgreen and, and most importantly the C4C has a very positive and a very nurturing relationship to, to uh, our startup company and that has been extremely important uh, for microgreen success. Finally, uh, student entrepreneurship, you know, I'd like to, if there are professors here, uh, I'd like to say that, that no, we, we cannot do this alone, you know, we, because we have already a very full agenda uh, for our jobs. So, um, uh, we, we cannot go it alone, and therefore, you know, we should be encouraging students uh, to take some risk and, and be entrepreneurs. And finally, you know, this was uh, um, advice I got when we were starting with microgreen, that uh, you know, ideas are really, really worth two cents. We shouldn't have uh, a misconception about what is the worth of our ideas. Okay, the 98 cents is all in the marketplace. It's in the business. It's in investment. It's in management. It's in marketing. All those things. Okay, so we should be willing to sort of let go. <laughs> you know, let go and let it flourish. Um, some other positive factors. The business plan competition here at the university was a catalyst in, in this whole thing happening. Because that's where the students got excited, they participated, they, they won you know, one, of the, one of their prizes, which was you know, $15,000 for a second place. Uh, it was a lot of money for the students and a lot of encouragement, you know, getting, getting the feedback from the VCs. So that's a real, that's a real plus. It's a great, uh, a great undertaking by the business school. Professional management is a must. I think, again, you know, uh, we may in, maybe as tech people uh, or professors who are deep in technology may not realize that management is is not everybody's cup of tea. And money management, professional management is most important for, for success of business. And fortunately, we have been under the leadership of Tom Malone since 2005. He's, uh, he's a professional. He has uh, nurtured, he's brought several ideas to companies up to, their, uh, up to the point when the companies were sold. So he's a very experienced businessman. Finally, you know, we, we had a technology platform, and Microgreen had a, developed it and scaled it up with, with a very strong vision for a particular product in mind. And that is extremely important because at this stage of the game, you cannot waste resources. You have to be very focused uh, in where, where, you, um, where, where you invest them. Some things that could have, could have uh, gone better with respect to commercialization. Um, there was a delay, I would say maybe a five to seven year delay before our technology uh, could, be, uh, could be commercialized because of the, some things that happened. There was, uh, we had a Japanese company in the consortium and they, they copied it, they patented it in Japan. And and uh, the tech transfer office at that time was not up to taking on the, the legal challenges. So there was a, a delay there. Um, the university gave uh, exclusive rights to microgreen. Um, perhaps at the time that was necessary because of this uh, black mark of the Japanese copying. It was a black mark on the technology. And um, so to offset it to some extent, you know, microgreen got an exclusive. But that exclusive has uh, its, its downside as well because other applications of this technology are, are delayed because of it, because, because microgreen really needs to be focused on one thing right now. And, and uh, they, they started out looking at a sub-licensing model, in fact, um, we spent some, we maybe a couple of years were spent in the sub-licensing activity uh, and joint developments, but that model, you know, was that was not the way to go. So that's uh, that's that's not a model that works. 
uh, and so they came back to manufacturing. Okay. Um, so I think I, ha I just have, um, let's see. I would like to sort of give you a little message. If you fly United, you are likely to see this message. As a part of United's EcoSkies program, we're taking actions across the company to help us create a more sustainable future for our customers, our coworkers, and our communities. Our commitment means offering more eco-friendly products to our customers and responsibly managing the waste we generate. Our new hot beverage cup is a perfect example. It's called InCycle by Microgreen, and it's no ordinary cup. It's the world's first fully recyclable hot beverage cup made from plastic water bottles. As a matter of fact, four and a half of our InCycle cups can be made from a single recycled bottle. And the best part is, they're made right here in the United States. You can help us recycle our new cups by keeping them free of litter when you hand your used cup back to the flight attendants for recycling. That means please, no napkins or other trash in your cups. Much better. We're excited about this major step forward in our commitment to the environment. And we hope you are too. Okay, so you see how important it is for companies today to, to, um, to be able to say that they are eco-friendly or they are, they are doing something for the environment. Uh, so I just have one one last slide. You know, so um, so that is a recipe for success. You have to find a real good entrepreneurial student. Okay, and here I have Krishna Nadala, um, who received the 2011 Early Career Award, Early Career Diamond Award from the College of Engineering. So thank you for your attention, and I'll be glad to uh, take any questions. Yeah. So it's a fundamental patent that was filed in what, 94 or something like that? Around that time, yeah. Is it about ready to expire? It is. I think this is the last year, 2014. Does the University of Washington have any intellectual property in microgreen now? They do. And what does that come from? Well, so, so there is continued. So my, Microgreen has been funding work and anything. A, a lot of things that have come out are sort of they go back to this uh, basic technology. Uh, uh, so, uh, so yeah. So there is a there's a whole bunch of new patterns with with the continuing value and. Uh, I think, I think the the agreement with Microgreen is structured in a way such that you know the financial things can continue or the royalty streams can continue even when the core technology expires. That's pretty, pretty nice. Because yeah. of ongoing intellectual property coverage. Well, they didn't have to do that, so I'm surprised they did. Yeah, I guess. Well, they've been sponsoring research in Vipin's lab that has produced improvements over the years that have been patented. Yeah. 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 What about other processes like injection molds? Is it applicable, possibly? Um, yes, so, um, so this process that we have is it's sort of limited to mass production of certain kind of items like so things that you can envision starting from a flat sheet and then using some kind of mold to produce a product those products we can produce by this process but if you so, but injection molding is a is a process is one of the main process to to make plastic based products um, and the experience there is you know, people are of course trying to make it microcellular, but because of the mold pressures that are so high, the reduction in densities are of the order of just 10 percent, 10 to 12 percent. So, how do you get like a 70 percent reduction in density? Uh, I I don't think we are anywhere near that in injection molding. So that's a that that's an area where I think we should invest in research. Yeah. 
care to say how much it costs to set up a manufacturing line, including the real estate? Uh, I'll just give you a very round number of $10 million for one manufacturing plant. Um, yeah. Did the Japanese company try to make the same for cups? Or what were they no, they, they, they uh, patented the manufacturing process, but their application was different. So their application was, um, so it turns out that if you, if you can imagine a flat sheet of this material, so um, it, it diffuses light very uniformly. So if you have a light bulb behind it, right, then what you see is, uh, is very uniformly diffused. So, so they, they came up with a, with a uh, light diffusing layer that is used in LCD TVs, TV screens, um, and all the, the major manufacturers from Korea. They, um, uh, so it, it's in, used in a lot of TVs. I think there's probably 10 million TVs by now that have, uh, that have this technology. And what Microgreen did uh, very, very uh, creatively is to, you know, they did not have resources to take them up on any kind of a legal basis. So they, they, they went to this company and they said, look, we know that you have this technology in, in, in TVs and you have big plants. So if you want us to stay quiet, you start giving us some royalty. Because if they were to disclose this, then the, the big companies, you know, the, the Samsungs and the LGs, they are not going to do business with any vendor with, that has a tainted uh, technology. So their strategy was successful, you know, so, um, and it also helped them with the much needed money in the beginning. Yeah? There were some concerns about leaching of chemicals that exclude plastics into drinking water, especially hot water. How did you overcome that? Um, it's not a concern in this particular plastic. Yeah, it has been certified by the FDA and has met every scrutiny on that account. Yeah. So have you cited in other plastics? Oh, so we have our hands full with just this one plastic. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, we, in the lab we have, we have worked, you know, almost 30 years now with this this technology, we have worked with a number of other other plastics uh, that all have niche applications that are waiting to be developed, and some are high-tech applications. So, uh, for example, we worked with Lockheed and uh, and Boeing for some applications that are that are confidential. Uh, so, when we introduce the bubbles, of course, the first thing is that we reduce the the density, and you can reduce the material you know, in something that is uh, simple like this. But it also has other properties. For example, the light diffusion is a, is, a, uh, is a different property leading to different application. Then uh, the dielectric constant can also be tuned uh, by, by controlling these bubbles. So you can reduce the dielectric constant. And, and so then it leads to some applications there where you want to reduce the crosstalk of electrical signals. Um, so just to, um, I, I had some of the slides that I took out because they were not central. But uh, in terms of what is, what is coming, what are some other technologies? So, so uh, these kind of products, let's say the, the thickness is of the order of a millimeter. Okay. So we have technologies that are, that are um, um, ready. For uh, let's say ten times, ten to twenty, thirty times thicker, thicker materials. So, so microcellular panels that would be load bearing, that would be anywhere from let's say ten millimeters to thirty millimeters thickness. Okay, we have a a. Um, so we had some we had some SBIR grants, and we have a, we have a process where we have demonstrated that you know we can make four by eight sheets of any thickness we want. Um, so that's that's towards making uh, thick uh, load-bearing insulating you know materials. 
And then we are currently working on, on going the other direction, which is, um, which is uh, forming thin films, right? So maybe uh, um, 10 to 50 times smaller thickness than this. Um, and that's, uh, so these are some of the things we are working on now. So uh, just um, ask one question before we wrap up. You mentioned that sublicensing didn't work for microgreen, and I'm interested in that statement because a lot of our startup companies are thinking about partnering sublicensing models. Hmm. Was there a specific reason it didn't work for microgreen? Well, um, the sublicensing and the joint product development strategies, uh, they were taking too long. And investors wanted to, to see cash. Investors wanted to see a, a, a cash flow and a revenue stream. And that was not, that just did not seem to generate in, in a timely manner um, uh, the cash stream that the, the investors were looking for. Was Mike Green trying to raise cash at the time or they'd already taken investment? No, they had only already taken right. cash. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you very much for coming to our seminar this afternoon, and let's thank Vikram for the talk. Yeah, thank you.